The fourth principle in our Reformed hermeneutic is entitled the historical element. Now, the historical element, on one hand, is uh, really not hard to understand. Um, it's more in uh, a challenge of do we appreciate it and do we enact the principle uh, for what it's worth. One example I could do to illustrate the historical element is to pick a passage of scripture that is kind of strange or unknown to us. Maybe a passage like 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, where Paul talks about meat sacrificed to idols. That would be an example of a practice in the Bible today that doesn't seem very familiar to us today. And so we have to go back in time, understand what was happening in the Greek and Roman world in order to appreciate what Paul is saying in this passage. Another way to deal with or to illustrate the importance of the historical element is to pick a passage that is really well known. And then to show that even though you know this parable or this, this passage already, it becomes more meaningful, more powerful once you understand its historical context. And it's the latter of these two examples that I've chosen to do to illustrate the historic element. I've picked the parable of the Good Samaritan. One of the best known stories uh, found in the Bible. In fact, many uh, non-Christians know this story uh, too. But I want to suggest to you that you can't really appreciate this parable. You can't fully understand its power, its impact, unless you look at its historical context. And so let's do that for a few moments together. And the specific historical context is the bad blood that exists between Jews and Samaritans. The whole force of the parable rests on that historical reality. So we can ask ourselves some questions like, who were the Samaritans anyway? That's a historical question. Well, they claim to be de descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. Maybe remember how the northern kingdom under the Assyrians were captured in 722 and taken away. But there were some who were left behind and they claimed to be descendants then of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And when the southern kingdom came back, they too were exiled under the Babylonians in 586. When some of the southern kingdoms came back and they met these Samaritans, who, remember, claimed to be descendants of the ten lost tribes of the northern kingdom, that bad blood that existed already between these two kingdoms flared up again. So in the book of Nehemiah, for example, you can see some of the tension already there between the Samaritans and the Jews. If you think of the geography of the land, it is also important. In the north, you have Galilee, where Jesus was born and gave much of his ministry. In the south, you have Judea. Now, if you were a Jew and you want to go to Jerusalem to offer up a sacrifice at the temple, you know, you might be tempted to take the shortest and most direct route north to south. However, that means you would go through that land in the middle, which you could see is called Samaria. And you're not sure whether for the two to three day journey, you would be given uh, lodging and food or that would be given to your animal. So instead, you have to cross over to the Jordan River, take the long, hotter route and then come up through Jericho rather than set one foot in that hated and despised land of Samaria. We have uh, the story in the Gospel of John of the Samaritan woman at the well. And she asked a question, which is an understandable one, if you understand the historical context and this tension between Samaritans and Jews. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, this is John 4, verse 9, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And any person of that day would say, yeah, that's a good question. What's Jesus, a man, doing, talking to a woman, and especially him, a Jew, talking to this Samaritan woman? We call this the parable of the what? The good Samaritan. But that makes no sense to the Jews of Jesus' day. That's an oxymoron. There is no such a thing as a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan would make as much sense as me talking about a good murderer or a good rapist. Good Samaritans don't exist for Jews. Notice in the telling of the story also what happens. Which of these three, Jesus says, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now, remember, the story involves three characters, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. And this is then, we would say, in colloquial terms, a no-brainer question. 
It's obvious what the answer is. It's not the priest. It's not the Levite. It's the Samaritan. But notice that's not the answer that the man gives. Instead, the man says, the one who had mercy on him. You see, the expert in the law hated the answer. This was a dirty trick that Jesus told, telling a parable, a story in which the heroes of the Jewish faith were embarrassed and our enemy, the Samaritan, is celebrated. And so he can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan, but instead uses a circumlocution. We call this a roundabout way of answering the question. You know what happens in Jesus' day if you start telling a parable in which the religious leaders, the priest and the Levite, are shamed, and our enemy, the Samaritan, is honored, you know what Jews start doing, don't you? They start looking around for rocks. I mean, this is a dangerous story to tell. And yet, this is what gives the story its power, its punch. Here is this hated and despised Samaritan, and can you believe it, as the story unfolds from a Jewish perspective, he stops. And yet again, this is what gives the bottom line of the parable its power. Let me give you the context before I read Jesus' last words. The context of the parable, Jesus didn't just tell this parable for no reason at all. Jesus told the parable because there was an expert in the law, some smarty pants in the Old Testament, who had heard about this rabbi, this teacher, this Jesus guy, and he wanted to test him out. And so he asked Jesus a question. By the way, we're following now our principle, right? We mentioned before about interpreting every passage in its context. In this case, it's historical context. So this Expert in the law asked Jesus a loaded question, right? He says, uh, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, of course, knows what's going on, that he's being put on the spot, and he cleverly turns the table around on the expert in the law. He says, well, what is written? You know, what do you think the answer is? This is a strategy I should follow when the students ask me hard questions. I should just turn around the question on them. But in any case, the expert in the law knows his Bible, and without Hesitation, he quotes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as himself. And the answer is a correct one. So Jesus says, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. And then the text says, but he, that is the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself. And so he asked a second loaded question, a question intended to justify himself, to prove to Jesus and the disciples and the perhaps gathering crowd that he had loved God and his neighbor as himself. And so he asked a second loaded question. He says, and who is my neighbor? Now, the only answer to that question from a Jewish point of view is your fellow Jew. But that's not the answer that Jesus gave. Jesus instead told a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, to show that our neighbor is not just our fellow Jew, a person from our own ethnic background. Our neighbor is not just somebody from our own socioeconomic status, people we feel comfortable with, someone we're willing to hang out with. No, our neighbor is anyone who is in need. And how ought we to deal with our neighbor? Jesus at the end says, go and do likewise. In other words, the same kind of compassion that this hated and despised Samaritan had, that's the way you have to act toward all those who are hurting and in need. Do you see how when we look at the historical context, this well-known story suddenly comes even more alive? We better understand the truth claim that's being made, and we feel the force of that text still today. In fact, we can use our historical principle not just in the exegesis of this text, but also in the application of this text. The application of a text like this can also become more alive when we kind of go back in time and we ask some historical type questions. For example... When we hear this story, we quickly blame the priest and the Levite. If we would have a drama, you know, and the priest and Levite would come on the stage, we would probably go boo or hiss, because we easily condemn them, and we certainly don't put ourselves in their position. But I want to suggest to you that that's a wrong way to think of the priest and the Levite. They were, after all, religious people. They were a priest and the Levite. They were people who obviously loved God and were serving Him. But... 
But they were people who filled their minds with excuses. We're going to see the really false reasons for not stopping and being neighbor to the person in their time of need. For example, maybe the priest and the Levite were worried about their own safety. This road from Jerusalem to Jericho, from a historical point of view, everyone knows is a dangerous road. Jerusalem is 2,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is way below sea level, and it's only about 12, 13 miles. You drop a huge amount of uh, distance within a short period of time. And it was a place where robbers and brigands would hide out and nab unsuspecting travelers. And so if you were on a famously dangerous road and you came across a man whose wounds were fresh, wouldn't you be worried that maybe the uh, robbers are still around and you might be the next victim? And so maybe they, they kept on going because they were worried about their own safety. Or maybe uh, they kept on going and didn't stop because, um, well, they were worried the man was dead. Our text says that he was unconscious. He didn't look like he was alive. And, and that day, if you touched a dead person, see, from a historical point of view, when you touched a dead person, you were considered unclean. And that would make it impossible for the priest and the Levite to do then their priestly and Levitical duties. So maybe they didn't stop because the man was believed to be dead. Or maybe they couldn't recognize the guy. I mean, there are a lot more non-Jews living in Palestine than there are Jews. And the man really has no clothes on because they were stolen. He's not talking. He's unconscious. So we can't tell from his apparel or from his uh, speech what ethnic background he is. Maybe he's even a hated and despised Roman. You see, the point I'm trying to show is that from an historical point of view, there are plausible reasons which the priest and the Levite could come up with for not stopping and being a neighbor to this person in their time of need. And you know what? That's exactly the way it is for you and me. We too are like the priest and the Levite, people who come up with plausible reasons, they're really excuses for not stopping and being a neighbor to people in their time of need. We say things to ourselves like, I haven't got the gifts to be a neighbor. I mean, some people are good at that kind of thing. You know, I had one of these spiritual gift survey type of things, and it turns out that I'm, I'm kind of awkward in these situations. I just don't know what to say or what to do. You know, some people are good at that, but that's not me. I, I don't have the gifts to be a neighbor. Or we might say, it's not my job to be a neighbor. That's the deacon's job. I mean, we have this benevolence fund, you know, this special fund, which is supposed to be for needy people, and I give my money to that. And, and you know, the deacons, you know, they, they're supposed to take care of that kind of situation. It's not my job to be a neighbor. Or we might not say, but we might think, I don't know if we should be a neighbor to everybody. I mean... A lot of people, it's their own problem. They keep making foolish decisions. I mean, if they would be like me, a little more responsible, they wouldn't find themselves a lot of people in this situation. I'm not so sure we should be a neighbor to everybody who's in need. You see, dear friends, we're not so different than the priest and the Levite. We, too, fill our minds with reasons or really excuses for not stopping and being a neighbor to people who are hurting and in need. Do you see how I use the historical element in order also for the application of the passage to come alive, to learn something about the culture and practices of that day in order to better understand the meaning of what God was saying to the people then and there, and also to bridge the gap to understand what God is now saying to us here and now. And this is the historical principle or the historical element it's kind of like going through a time warp. We want to go back in time, either to the Jewish world, the Roman world, but to the time of the Bible, because the more we can understand the attitudes, the culture, the practices of that time, the better position we are to accurately interpret the Bible. Because, I know you know this already, but the Bible did not fall down from heaven in the King James Version with red letters and maps and a concordance in the back. No, God chose to reveal himself in history through real historical people who lived in historical situations and places. And that's what makes this principle so important. So the more we can do to understand a passage in its 
historical context. Sometimes we talk about a passage in its cultural context. Sometimes we have a little German phrase, maybe I should mention it to you because we often find it in some of the scholarly writing. They refer to the Sitzum Leben, the Sitzum Leben. In, in German it would be translated the situation in life. But all of these things are, this, are referring to the same reality, the historical context, the social setting, or the Sitzum Leben. We would need to somehow uh, go back and understand the culture and the history and the time in which the biblical text is taking place. And that's our crucial fourth uh, hermeneutical principle. Well, so far, I've given you the principle. I've given you an example in order to make that principle hopefully more meaningful and to kind of stress the idea that it can make the Bible come alive. And uh, for me, this is a uh, personal truth. Uh, I remember I take trips to uh, Greece and to Turkey and to Israel, and that's another way in which we can understand the historical context, where we understand how far places are from each other, and the more we learn about the Greek and the Roman world. For me, it's a very invigorating thing. The Bible is, is not just made up of some mythical places, you know, and some events that happened a long, long time ago. I can imagine these things happening, and for me, it's a stimulating thing when the historical context uh, makes any biblical passage more understandable and more real. But once we do that, once we enact the, pro the, um, the historical principle, we, we sometimes meet a problem. Uh, I call it the problem of the historical gap. And by that I mean that there is a gap between what the Bible is talking about and our situation today. The Bible is describing some practice or happening or activity which doesn't seem so relevant for today. There's a gap between the then and there and the here and now. I call that the historical gap. Now when you meet that historical gap, then there are two different ways to respond. We could talk about Scripture being culturally conditioned, or we could talk about Scripture being culturally bound. One of these things, I think, is true, and I want to argue for it, but the other one is false, and I want to argue against it. First, the true one. I think we need to say that Scripture is culturally conditioned. Condition just means that the Bible is conditioned, it's shaped, it's affected, it's impacted by its culture. In other words, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, three chapters, about meat sacrificed to idols, he wasn't thinking at all about us for today. He had no clue about us at all for today. He was thinking only about the Corinthians and their problem and their situation. That passage, those chapters are conditioned, they're impacted by that cultural setting. And the fact that the New Testament is written in Greek and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, those aren't languages of today. They are languages of the Bible's time. And so that's another way in which Scripture proves itself to be conditioned, impacted, shaped by its own individual culture. So I want to suggest to you that the Bible or Scripture is 100% culturally conditioned. All of the Bible, to some degree, is impacted or affected by its culture, by its historical context. Now, having said that, I would argue that none of the Bible is culturally bound, that 0% of the Bible is somehow stuck in its cultural context. What am I referring to here? Well, there are some people, when they meet the gap between what the Bible meant then and there, and it seems not at all to be relevant to the here and now, they say to themselves, oh, that passage is bound to its culture. That passage is stuck somehow in, for instance, the first century, and it can't somehow transfer across the generations and be relevant for us for today. So when they would meet maybe a passage like meat sacrificed to idols, they would say, and wrongly so, by the way, oh, that has nothing to do for us in our Western culture, and so they just kind of skip over it. Those passages of 1 Corinthians are bound, they're stuck, they're so rooted in its historical context, they have nothing to say to the contemporary believer. 
And I want to argue against that position. I want to argue that even though all of the Bible, 100% of the Bible is conditioned by its cultural context, its historical setting, I want to argue that 0% of the Bible, none of the Bible is bound or stuck in its historical context or its cultural setting. I have a quote here from John Cooper, a colleague of mine at Calvin Theological Seminary. He says, But first it is crucial to reiterate that all of the Bible is authoritative and normative for today. The issue is not whether the Bible is normative or which parts are normative, but how is it normative for today? It's a short quote, but there's some important things in here. He says, it's crucial to reiterate that all of the Bible is authoritative and normative for today. Normative means there's a mustness about the scriptures, right? That we need to do it or to submit to it. And Cooper's quote says that all of the Bible is authoritative and normative for today. So the issue is not whether it's normative or what parts are. So our task in exegesis is not to somehow go through the scriptures and say, what things are still true for us for today and what things aren't? As if we kind of chop up the Bible and we end up with a quote-unquote holy Bible, right? With some parts that are still true and other parts that we either have cut out, and maybe not physically, but we, we, we think are no longer true for today. They're not relevant for us. Instead, Cooper says, all of the Bible is authoritative. The whole question is, how is it authoritative for today? How is it normative for today? How are even passages like meat, sacrificed idols, still true for the church for today? Or to put it differently, we're asking the question, how do we bridge the historical gap? When you meet a gap between the then and there of the text and the here and now of today, how do you make the move from then to here and now? Well, I have an answer for that that I'd like to suggest to you, and it's to make a distinction. It's an important distinction, and I'm not the only one who has done it. And you can see it already in this Acts of Synod, these documents from the Christian Reformed Church of which I am a part. They say, a distinction must be made between a moral principle and the application of that principle. The former is normative for the Christian life today. The latter is not necessarily so. Now, we're going to have a few more quotes that all say ultimately the same thing, so we've got to slow down and make sure we get this distinction right. A distinction between a moral principle, on the one hand, and the application of that moral principle. Those are two separate things. Right? I'm going to talk sometimes about an underlying truth claim found in Scripture, and then how we apply that underlying truth claim in a new or contemporary way to today. Sometimes I talk about the two-step hermeneutical or exegetical dance. We first have to find what that moral principle or underlying truth claim is, and then the second step of the dance is we have to apply it now in a new situation, a contemporary situation of today. Some more quotes that talk about that same distinction. Here's a quote from Louis Burkhoff. This is a Reformed theologian, and he says this about some Old Testament laws, for example. He says, Sometimes we may have to come to the conclusion that while certain laws no more apply in the form in which they were cast, yet their underlying principle is just as binding today as it ever was. So if you have some Old Testament laws, for instance, maybe some laws about... um, how Israel Israel life should be conducted. Well, the actual law in its existing form may not be exactly applicable today, but he says the underlying principle of that law is still true for today. For instance, if there's some Old Testament law about in a flat-roofed home about maybe having a fence right around the top so that your safety and the safety of your guests are ensured, There is a principle underlying that law, a principle of equity or a principle of justice, which still needs to be applied today, even though maybe the manifestation of that law, that specific kind of fence and that specific kind of uh, house, may not be so applicable. Well, here's another quote from uh, the little booklet by Cooper that we've looked at already. He says, Reformed hermeneutics recognizes the difference between a principle and the application of that principle. A principle states God's abiding will for our lives, but how that principle is applied may vary from time and place. So again, this distinction between underlying truth claim moral principle and the application of that underlying truth claim or moral principle. 
Here's another uh, quote from uh, the document of uh, Synod. It says, The biblical text often contains concrete applications made in specific historical situations. Care should be taken not to transfer such applications directly to the different situations obtaining today. Now, notice this phrase. One must first seek to discover the abiding principle. That's the first step in the two-step exegetical or hermeneutical dance, right? One must first seek to discover the abiding principle, and then only after discovering the underlying principle, only after that first step in the exegetical dance is done, then we can do the second step, and that is seek to apply it in a different situation today. Now, this is not something that is unique, this solution to bridging the historical gap to the Reformed faith. I have a quote here from James Packer, again using him as a representative of the broader evangelical church. It's another kind of long Pauline sentence, but notice again the distinction between universal truths and the application of those universal truths. He says, So, just as it is possible to identify in all the books of Scripture universal and abiding truths about the will, work, and ways of God, that would be step one in our exegetical dance, right? It is equally possible to find in every one of them universal and abiding principles of loyalty and devotion to the holy, gracious Creator, and then to detach from these, from the particular situations to which, and the cultural frames within which the books apply them, that's all, that's, that's a tough sentence, I grant you, but that's all that first step. Discovering what those underlying truth claims are, those universal and abiding truths is the language he uses. And then finally he gets now to the second step at the end of the quote. He says, and to reapply them to ourselves in the places, circumstances, and conditions of our own lives today. Well, I've given to you this proposal, this solution to bridging the historical gap with these statements, with this proposal of first step one, discover the abiding truth claim, the underlying moral truth claim, and then step two, apply it in a new or contemporary context. That's all kind of theoretical, so now I'm going to try to take that uh, uh, solution and apply it to three different texts. All right? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to illustrate this for you with three different texts. Now, there's something similar about all three texts, and there's something different about all three texts. First of all, what's different? I'm going to give you three different texts in which the, the historical gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm going to start off with a text in which the gap between the then and there of the Bible's day and the here and now of today is kind of small. Then I'm going to move to a passage where the gap is a little bit bigger, and then the third example, the gap is going to be quite big. So that's how they're different from each other. But I'm going to treat each passage exactly the same way. I'm going to follow this two-step exegetical or hermeneutical dance. For each one of them, I'm going to first, step one, discover the underlying truth claim or moral principle. Then once we've done that, then we're going to walk 2,000 years to today, and we're going to reapply it in a new or contemporary situation. And so I hope by these three examples, I will, in a more concrete way, illustrate for you this Solution: How do you bridge the historical gap? How do you, in a sermon or in a class, move from the then and there of the Bible's day to the here and now of today? All three passages come from Paul. You may remember that I'm an expert in Paul, and so I've st stuck with somewhat safe material. So the first text is one where the gap is small. There's a minimal gap between the Bible's day and today. And the text comes from Colossians 3, 1 to 3, and it goes like this. If, now notice how artificial some of our hermeneutical distinctions are. I'm talking now, of course, about the fourth one, the historical one, but I don't forget about the literary, the grammatical, or the Holy Spirit ones. Those are all part of the process, too. And so I pick up the second one right off the bat with a little word, if. Because in the Greek language, there are three different kinds of ifs. I won't get into that now, other than to say, this is the if where you say, if such and such is the case, and I know for sure it is. And that's why some translations, instead of rendering it as, if this is the case, they instead translate it, as our translation here does, with the word since. And I just say this to show you that these five hermeneutical principles that I'm presenting you with, on one hand, they can be distinguished from each other for pedagogical, for learning reasons. 
But on the other hand, they often do overlap with each other. Well, let's go back to our example. So if, or from a grammatical point of view, better to say, since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So, remember the two steps. The first step is we have to discover the abiding principle or the underlying moral truth claim. That's our exegesis. That's the then and there question that we want to first answer and get that right. Now, notice what Paul says. He says to the Colossians, he says that they have in some sense died and also risen with Christ. Now, I imagine the Colossians might have been a bit puzzled by that. They said, what are you talking about, Paul? I haven't died. I'm still alive. And Paul would say to them, oh, yes, you have. Paul would say, this is his favorite phrase, by the way, if you are in Christ, right, in Christ. That's an evangelical way of saying, uh, you know, do you have a relationship with Christ? That's a kind of reform way of saying, do you belong body and soul and life and a death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? And Paul says you do. If the answer is yes to all of that, well, everything that Jesus did, in a certain sense, you did. It's almost like you're riding piggyback on Jesus and everything that he accomplished, you get to share in his victory. And so when Jesus died, in a very real sense, you died, or more specifically, your sinful nature died. And when Jesus rose and won the victory over Satan, sin, and death, in a very real sense, you too have risen, right? You've been, to, to quote from John, now a different biblical writer, you've been born again, right? You now have been freed from your enslavement to sin. And because you share in the death and the resurrection of Christ, you're not the same people anymore. You don't think the same. You don't act the same. You don't even talk the same. In fact, the rest of Colossians spells out the implications of this abiding or underlying moral truth claim, namely that sharing in the death and resurrection of Christ has consequences for our moral life. So in the following verses, Paul will say, you know, when, when somebody does something wrong against you, you don't get angry, you forgive them. And when good things happen to people, you're not jealous, but you rejoice. And when good things happen to you, you give thanks to God. Those are all the natural moral consequences of sharing in the death and resurrection of Christ. So I want to suggest to you that my exegesis tells me that the truth claim, the moral underlying truth claim of this passage is that a believer sharing in the death and resurrection of Christ naturally has consequences for the moral life that believers now live. That's step one. So, I'm going to grab that principle, here it comes, right? And I'm going to now go 2,000 years, and I want to now apply it, step two, to today. And so I look at you, and I go, now, now you're not really the same as the Colossians. I mean, you look different than them. I mean, you live in a different place than they do. You don't speak Greek like they do. And so there's a bit of a gap, isn't there, between the original readers and their historical context and you and your historical context of today. It's not a big gap. And what's more, the underlying moral truth claim is every bit as relevant for you today as it was for them then. In fact, I can come to you, I need to come to you, the audience today, and say, now, in a very real sense, you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Exactly the words that Paul said to the Colossians. And at first blush, you might be surprised. You say, what are you talking about, uh, Brother Jeff? I, I haven't died. I'm still alive, right? And I would say, oh, yes, you have. I would say, if you are in Christ, right? If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you belong body and soul and life and in death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, well, then Everything Jesus did, in a very real sense, you did. You share in his death and his resurrection. And what's more, if you share in his death and resurrection, that has practical, obvious consequences in your moral life and how you think, speak, and act. Did you see what happened here? Now, most of the time, we, we do this so naturally. In other words, much of the Bible, this gap between the Bible's day and our day is very, very small, and, and we don't have to think very hard about how do you get from the then and there to the here and now. We don't have to maybe think about it as a two-step dance, but yet, I want to suggest to you it's important and helpful if we do. 
Well, let's go to another example. And this one is where the gap is a little bit bigger. It comes from another one of Paul's letters. It's Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. And it's a passage in which there is division between Jewish Christians in Ephesus and Gentile Christians in that city. The Jewish Christians are saying, you know, if you really want to be up to snuff as a believer of Jesus, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised. And the Gentile Christians are saying, you've got to be kidding, you've got to be kidding, you've got to be kidding. And so there is a bit of a tension between these two groups of people. And so Paul, not just in our passage, but elsewhere in the letter, has to address the problem of division in the church. And what does Paul do here in this passage? If you take time to look it up, you'll see language that he repeats. Now, when an author repeats something, they're obviously emphasizing something, right? I mean, good speakers don't say the same thing twice. Good speakers don't say the same thing twice, right? Oh, unless, again, they're stressing or emphasizing something. And Paul says a number of times in this passage that, that the two have become one with the result that there is or there ought to be peace. The two, of course, are Jew and Gentile, and they become one, and that word peace, erine in Greek, occurs four times in this passage. Because Paul's argument to the Ephesians is that the two of you, you Gentile readers and you Jewish leaders who are divided, actually Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. That's Paul's language exactly in this passage. With the result that now there's one new person, right? You're one body united in Christ, and that ought to result then in peace, right? Right? The relationship of the church ought to be characterized by peace. Now, again, I'm going to do the two-step dance. In order then to discover what the underlying moral truth claim is, to engage in exegesis, I'm suggesting to you that Paul is claiming what? That Jesus' death has in some real but profound way taken the two, made them into one united body with the result that there ought to be peace that characterizes their interrelationship. So, if that's step one, if that's the underlying truth claim, the moral principle, we pick it up and now we engage in step two. So I, I now carry this principle to 2,000 years and I look at my audience and I say to you, now, now, wait a minute, you don't look quite like the Ephesians. There's a bit of a gap between your day and the Ephesians' day. I mean, you live in a different place than they do. Uh, you live in a different time than they do. You speak a different language than they do. And what's more, they were divided over circumcision. And, well, I haven't really met too many people today, you know, where churches are divided, where one half of the church is the pro-circumcision crowd and the other half is the anti-circumcision crowd. So there is a gap, a little bigger one, isn't there, between the Bible's day and our day. But we do the same thing we did in the last passage. We reapply that principle in our new and contemporary situation. Because when I look at you and your situation, you may not be divided over circumcision, but there's all kinds of other ways in which you might be divided. Half of your church might be uh, the kind of organ-playing, psalm-singing folks, and the other half might be the drums and guitar and overhead hallelujah folks. One half of your congregation might be the, the red letter King James fall down from heaven with maps and an accordance in the back kind of folks. And, and the other half might be the Eugene Peterson, the message kind of folks. Or in a more serious matter, one half might be the vehemently opposed to women in any form of ministry folks. And the other half might be the egalitarians who think there's nothing wrong with women serving in any role. Now, it seems to me that I have a right as a preacher or a teacher to come to you and to take this principle and apply it now to your new situation. Now, I grant you that this principle in our text for Ephesians 2, 11 to 22 will not answer the specific question of whether we should be a psalm playing, a organ playing versus the overhead drums, guitar, hallelujah. It won't answer that question. And this principle won't answer the question about whether we should be the Red Letter King James folks or the Eugene Peterson, the message folks. Nor will this passage answer the specific question of whether we should be anti or for women in office. But as we seek to answer those issues on the basis of other texts of Scripture, we always do so with this principle very much in mind, namely, 
that as we debate these things, we do so from a perspective in which, which in Christ, the two of us, whatever two positions might be, have in a very real sense, profound sense, be made one new person in Christ with the result that there is, or there ought to be, peace. Well, the third and final example is where the gap is quite big. There's a rather large gap between the then and there of the text and the here and now of today. And the passage I picked is 1 Corinthians 16, 20b, greet each other with a holy kiss. I have a picture here I'm going to go ahead and just show you, which illustrates, uh, you know, the difficulty of this passage. You have the straight-laced, suit-wearing Western Christian uh, who wants to greet uh, the Arab believer one way, and the Arab believer is ready for the holy smooch, but the Western believer looks quite uncomfortable with this. So, so what, do we, what, do, what do we do with a text like this, right? Greet each other with a holy kiss. Well, one thing we don't do is say, oh, wait a minute, here's an example where Scripture is culturally bound, right? Where the gap is so big between the Bible's day and our day that somehow this text is stuck in its own cultural context and it has nothing to say to us for today. This passage, greet each other with a holy kiss, is every bit as relevant for us today as the last two passages we looked at. The whole question is, how is it relevant for us for today? That's the quote from John Cooper earlier. How is greet each other with a holy kiss, how is that still true for believers today? And in order to answer that question, I suggest to you we do the same two-step historical or hermeneutical dance that we've been doing all along. We first discover the underlying truth claim or moral principle, and then we can talk about applying it in a contemporary or modern situation. Now, in this third example, where the gap is really big, uh, it may be harder to do our exegesis. We may have to do a greater effort in trying to discover what that underlying truth claim is. There may also be uh, more disagreement among Christians about that underlying truth claim. But I want you to know that I'm not ruling out that the actual underlying truth claim is that we greet each other with a holy kiss. That's an open possibility, too. I'm not ruling that out either. But let me suggest to you uh, my exegesis, how you might come to an understanding of what that deeper abiding principle or underlying moral truth claim is. So a couple of observations. The first question uh, I thought would be helpful to ask is this. What does a kiss mean in the first century? Maybe a kiss means something different back then than it does for today. And very quickly I found out that that was the case. With hardly any effort at all, I found out that a kiss in the ancient world was what? Was a outward expression of forgiveness, a kind of outward, tangible way of reconciling yourself with another person. Well, you know that from the scriptures themselves, don't you? I mean, think of Jacob and Esau. Jacob uh, cheated his brother out of his birthright and then spent his life running away from his brother, but he finally couldn't shake him. He heard that Esau is coming. Esau is coming. He was shaking in his boots, and he tried to buy his brother off by sending him all kinds of presents, bribing him, and he sent all of his herds ahead of him. Even his family went ahead of him, and then brave uh, Jacob came up bringing at the rear. And then when they meet, the text says that Esau kissed him. Now that wasn't just Hey, bro, long time no see. I mean, kissing him was an outward sign that I forgive you. Despite your cheating me of my birthright, despite what you have done to me in the past, I forgive you. Same thing is found in the New Testament with the parable of the two lost sons. Not just the younger son, but the older son is lost too. But the younger son, after he kind of comes to his senses and remembers how good he had it with his dad and he hopes to plead for his mercy, and he heads home. And we read that the father gets up, runs to his son, and kisses him. And, and that's a powerful expression of forgiveness. I mean, even though, son, you want me dead, right? You couldn't wait for me to die. You want me to die right now to get my inheritance. Even though you shame me in this way, I forgive you. And by the way, that's what makes Judas's kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane so blasphemous. I mean, because the kiss is supposed to symbolize oneness, reconciliation, and it was just the opposite in Judas's case. I mean, Judas could have identified Jesus to the soldiers lots of the way. He could have said, it's this guy, it's over him over there. But to do it by a kiss, you see, it kind of undermines the very thing that the kiss is supposed to symbolize. 
So the first thing I learned was that a kiss in the ancient world was an outward expression of forgiveness, a tangible sign of reconciliation between two people. Second thing I observed. Greet each other with a holy kiss. I said to myself, I think I've heard that before. And in fact, when I did a little quick concordance study, I found it occurs in four of Paul's letters. So in four of Paul's letters, he commands his readers to greet each other with a holy kiss. And I said to myself, well, Paul wrote a lot more than four letters. Why did he command only these four churches? Actually, it's three churches. It's the Corinthian church two letters, the Romans church and the Thessalonian church. Why only these three churches and none of the others? And then when I looked at each of the letters to those three churches, I realized that in the body of the letter, in the main part of the letter, Paul has dealt with the problem of division. That's most obvious uh, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Right off the bat in 1st Corinthians, after the opening Thanksgiving in chapter 1, verse 10, boom, right off the bat, Paul has to deal with the problem of divisions. And he goes on for many, many chapters because it was a big problem in that congregation. And in Rome, I mean, Rome has, Romans has lots of powerful theological truths, yes, but when Paul applies those truths toward the end in chapters 14 and 15, he has some, some, some lengthy discussion about the strong and the weak and the divisions, especially between Jewish and Gentile believers in the capital city of Rome. And to a lesser extent, we have a problem in Thessaloniki, in the Thessalonian letters, especially between the majority of the church and the attaktoi in Greek, the rebellious idlers, those who were not working but were being lazy and sponging off of the hospitality and generosity of uh, fellow Christians. So, I observe that Paul doesn't command every church to greet each other with a holy kiss, but just those three churches where he had explicitly in the body of the letter addressed the problem of division among believers. So that was a second important observation I made. And then a third uh, thing that is important, and that is where these kiss greetings occur. They occur in the end of the letters. In other words, they don't occur in the letter opening. They don't occur in the Thanksgiving section. They don't occur in the body of the letter. They occur in that fourth, final section of a letter, the letter closing. And I happen to know something about letter closings because I wrote a book on the subject. And I know from my study of Paul's other letter closings that what? That Paul is such a skilled letter writer that he is able to shape and adapt his letter closing in such a way that it echoes in such a way that it summarizes sometimes the main points that he's talked about in the body of the letter. Well, it's not really so surprising. I mean, a good preacher at the end of the sermon will summarize the key points of the message. Paul, not so surprisingly, at the end of his letters, summarizes or at least alludes to or echoes the main points that he's been talking about in the letter as a whole. So if you put all of these three points together, getting back to our text, namely that a kiss is not just a kiss. A kiss is an outward expression of forgiveness or a public demonstration of reconciliation. Two, that um, uh, Paul gives this greeting not to all his churches, but just those churches that have been or currently enduring separation, division of one kind or another. And three, that Paul is apparently gifted enough and has the practice of taking the letter closing and what? Adapting it, expanding it so that it echoes or it alludes to, sometimes even summarizes the main point of the body of the letter. When you put that all together, it seems to me then that one can make a case that what Paul is really arguing about in the letter closing, when he says, greet each other with a holy kiss, that's an implicit command to do what he in the body of the letter had explicitly commanded them to do. Or to put it differently, the the command to greet each other with a holy kiss is a command to deal with each other outwardly in a public way that demonstrates the oneness, the togetherness we have in Christ, that kind of oneness togetherness that I argued for in the body of the letter earlier. And if that's the underlying truth claim, then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to now do step two. I'm going to pick up that moral truth claim, namely that Christians need to outwardly express or deal with each other in a way that demonstrates the 
forgiveness, the oneness, the togetherness they have in Christ. So I'm going to pick that up and carry it over to today. And I look at you, and again, there's a gap between the Bible's day and our day. But I'm going to put this principle into practice into today. And in today, in a North American context, it probably isn't appropriate to greet you with a holy kiss. That would probably be misinterpreted. It would be better for me maybe to greet you with a holy handshake or maybe a holy hug. That would be the best way to put into practice that underlying truth claim, that abiding principle. However, in other parts of the world, the best way to apply that principle is to greet each other with a holy kiss. There are some places in the world where the most powerful and effective way to demonstrate outwardly the oneness, the reconciliation you have with another believer is to greet that person with a holy kiss. Well, friends... uh, This is admittedly a kind of difficult subject, but it's an oh-so-crucial one. Because there are some parts of the Bible that seem to be distant from today. There is indeed a gap often between the historical context of the biblical text and our own historical context. Now, we still have to highlight the historical context. That was the first part of this session. How crucial it is and how the text can come alive when we explore the cultural context when we learn more about the attitudes, the practices of that day. That's how the biblical text can not only be more understandable, but more powerful, more alive, more real. But in the second half of our time together, we've been bridging this historical gap. And hopefully you remember this two-step exegetical or hermeneutical dance, how we move from the then and there of the text, exegesis, And we then reapply these moral truth claims, these abiding principles in the here and now of today. This is another very, very important way by which we can read the Bible for all it's worth.